at least 30 killed in an al-Shabaab attack in the Somali town of Baidoa. How Kenyan women are being empowered to overcome the country's gender gap. And red carpet chic from this year's Academy Awards. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We begin in Somalia, where authorities say twin bombing attacks on Sunday killed at least 30 people in the town of Baidoa. The terrorist group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility for that, those attacks. Police and local government officials say the center of the town, located 245 kilometers west of Mogadishu, was very busy when a car bomb exploded near the main market. A second blast, believed to be from a suicide bomber, was detonated moments later at a restaurant. At least 40 others were wounded in the explosions. The attacks came two days after two massive explosions killed 25 people and wounded nearly 60 others in Mogadishu. Al-Shabaab also claimed responsibility for those bombings. When Nigerian officials say President Mohamedou Buhari is launching a probe after a week-long clashes between Muslim herdsmen and Christian farmers left hundreds dead. Fulani herdsmen and four farming communities armed with guns and machetes battled last week in the latest round of violence of a long-running battle over grazing rights in central Nigeria. The predominantly Muslim Fulani have been blamed for waves of attacks on mainly Christian agrarian groups as tensions grow in the central state of Benu over access to land and public services. For more on the clashes, Abuja-based journalist Paul Okolo joins me now via Skype from Abuja, Nigeria. Paul, uh, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much. Now, uh, first, uh, do we have any updates uh, on the numbers of people that have been killed throughout the week in these clashes? Well, we don't have a fixed figure. We still have uh, um, different figures from different sources. It's usually in the hundreds, the sources say. Um, but the latest update actually today is that um, there are moves being made to see that there is a ceasefire um, among the, the warring factions. Yes. And that has been uh, the, the development, the latest development we have from the scene of, of battle. Now, we know that Benu is uh, Nigeria's middle belt, where the mainly Christian South meets the mostly uh, Muslim North. Question is here, uh, what really fuels these clashes? Is it just uh, posture or is ethnic differences or just religion? It's a mixture of um, all of those uh, factors. Um, economic in the sense that the farmers are competing for space with the cattle rearers, cattle herders who need to graze their cattle in the traditional uh, way they've been doing it over the years. And this often results in a crashes because it, the animals destroy farmlands and the farmers are naturally unhappy and the, the, it results in clashes between the two with a very uh, uh, destructive uh, consequences. Um, sectarian in the sense that the, the uh, Fulani herdsmen are mainly Muslim, while the farmers who are usually affected by the destruction of crops um, are uh, mainly Christians, uh, and then it's ethnic in the sense that the farmers are um, local people who live in the neighborhood, who, who, who are indigenous of the area, whereas the Fulani uh, nomadic people, they're found all over northern Nigeria, indeed all over Nigeria these days, yeah. um, uh, going around with their cattle looking for grazing land, now, which is becoming desperately uh, in short supply. Now, Paul, this is uh, something that is a fact and a reality of that part of uh, uh, the country. The Fulani will be there. They've always been around there. They may not be indigenous. Has the government found a way of either creating harmony or helping the Fulani to change their lifestyle so they may settle in one place? Each time there is a clash like this, there are often moves to bring about a resolution. They are usually temporary and um, 
um, is just to quench the fire at the end of the uh, flame at a particular point in time. And after some time, we see um, the incident coming up all over again. The problem is that the Fulanis, from what I gather, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are stuck with their old ways and they don't want to resort to having the ranches, which people think will bring about a permanent, a more permanent solution to the problem. They prefer to go around the country with their cattle and um, anything that comes along their way is seen as a threat to their lifestyle, to their culture, and they resist with everything at their disposal. A very, very complicated situation. Thanks a lot, Paul, uh, for your reporting from there. Uh, that's uh, uh, Paul O'Connell, who is an Abuja-based journalist, reporting live via Skype from Nigeria. Now, fear is spreading in Europe on Monday as more than 40 suspected jihadists were caught entering Europe while posing as Syrian refugees. 19 of the 43 were captured in Turkey, but the rest made it into the European Union before being identified. Turkish military officers say they found more than 10 kilograms of explosives and four bomb vests that allegedly could be used in suicide attacks. Uh, viewers Yane Boyedjevski has more. The latest interception of jihadist infiltrators fits into public fears in Europe about more terror attacks. There is growing pressure to curb the entry of asylum seekers who the terror groups seek to radicalize. Austria has announced it will deploy extra troops to help patrol the border and carry out checks on those arriving in the country. The move comes amid a wave of criticism directed at the rigid asylum application limit. We have to work together to reduce the flu of uh, people who uh, have less or no chance to get asylum. If indeed the Schengen zone is to continue as an open border arrangement with the EU, the outside borders of Schengen should be closely controlled, says Janusz Bukajski, a senior fellow at the Center for European Policy and Analysis. In other words, it's up to the, the Greek government and with European assistance to control the refugees that enter the country. The refugee crisis is stoking tensions among the countries in the migrant corridor. For example, Macedonia and Greece. Authorities of both countries say some refugees have used false passports. Macedonia's Minister of Defense said that must stop. It's important uh, that we allow those people who need to some protection to move forward, but we have to also uh, be aware that among those people we have some, some uh, people who are not with best intentions. Greece has come under fire for its inability to properly control its maritime border with Turkey and for allowing refugees to pass through the country with only a minimal amount of paperwork. According to Bugajski, the line has to be drawn and the message should be clear. That they simply won't be able to come in unless they qualify under very, very strict guidelines because Europe simply cannot handle so many refugees each year. Pressure is growing on Greece. The European Commission adopted a report proposing recommendations to address deficiencies in external border management. Some countries have been pushing to evict Greece from the Schengen zone, a step European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker does not support. Jana Bojewski, VOA News, Washington. U.S. President Barack Obama says if the conflicting parties in Syria halt all violence as agreed, it could be a first step toward finding the chaos, or rather ending the chaos there. But he says a lasting peace in Syria is impossible as long as President Bashar al-Assad stays in power. Mr. Obama also says a concerted allied effort is weakening the Islamic State's power and influence in that region. A viewer says Latin Zahok has more. President Obama said a cessation of hostilities in Syria is scheduled to start Friday at midnight, but acknowledged that even under the best of circumstances, all violence is not expected to end immediately. Everybody knows what needs to happen, and that is all parties that are part of this cessation of activities need to end attacks, including aerial bombardment. Humanitarian aid must be allowed to reach areas under siege. And a lot of that is going to depend on whether the Syrian regime 
Russia and their allies live up to their commitments. Obama said if all parties adhere to their commitments, the region could focus on fighting the terrorists. If implemented, and that's a significant if, this cessation could reduce the violence and get more food and aid to Syrians who are suffering and desperately need it. It could save lives. Potentially, it could also lead to negotiations on a political settlement to end the civil war so that everybody can focus their attention on destroying ISIL. Obama said the fight to destroy Islamic State will take time, but he said concerted coalition efforts have weakened the group substantially in the past year. Thanks to our wave of strikes against its oil infrastructure, tanker trucks, wells and refineries, ISIL's oil production and revenues are significantly reduced. We're destroying the storage sites where ISIL holds its cash. Its money is literally going up in smoke. As a result, ISIL has been forced to slash the salaries of its fighters, which increasingly diminishes their morale. Obama said the strengthening of the Turkish border has made it harder for foreign fighters to join Islamic State, but he said the group's own brutality has made it less attractive. As a result, its core in Iraq and Syria continues to shrink. With concerted international effort to diminish Islamic State's resources and its propaganda, Obama vowed the group will be destroyed. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. Well, after Tuesday, Americans could have a much better sense of who will be this year's Republican and Democratic presidential nominees. Viewers Michael Bowman reports 12 states hold primary elections or caucuses Tuesday, and in most of those states, polls show Republican frontrunner Donald Trump and Democratic frontrunner Hillary Clinton with substantial leads. The so-called Super Tuesday contests could give Donald Trump a virtual glide path to the Republican nomination. People are so tired of these politicians, just all talk, no action. We are going to make America great again. We're going to win, win, win. And tomorrow? This campaign goes national. Similarly, Hillary Clinton could emerge as the presumptive Democratic nominee. Her challenger, Senator Bernie Sanders, insists the battle is far from over and is sticking to his message. The middle class of this country has been shrinking and almost all new income and wealth has been going to the top 1%. Donald Trump will never be the Republican nominee. Republican contenders, meanwhile, hope to halt or at least slow Trump's momentum. Marco Rubio hopes to capitalize on a strong debate performance last week. This is not a game where you draw maps and you around. Don't know what it what is your plan? We are not going to let the conservative movement and the party of Ronald Reagan and the party of Abraham Lincoln be taken over by a first rate con artist. Rubio's won nothing. He couldn't get elected dog catcher in Florida. They hate him in the state of Florida. Ever a lightning rod for controversy, Trump is drawing sharp criticism from Democrats, too. Clinton's dominating victory in South Carolina's Democratic primary allows her to pivot towards a general election campaign message. We don't need to make America great again. America has never stopped being great. But we do need to make America whole again. Instead of building walls, we need to be tearing down barriers. Whether lauded, vilified, or mocked, Trump continues to dominate headlines and consume an oversized portion of America's political oxygen. Being at the center of the storm has served him well so far and will be put to the test once again on Tuesday. Michael Bowman, VOA News, Washington. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. Check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, overcoming Kenya's gender gap. Stay with us.
there was action outside the debate hall. Political season is about to change too. VOA News, Las Vegas. Sheikh Asali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We'll pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. Now, in business, we introduce Option Pit. Option Pit provides trader education, focusing on traders who want to become full-time professional traders, and traders that are already trading large amounts of capital. Now, Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino spoke with Mark Sebastian, founder of Option Pit. The S&P 500 has rallied nearly 150 points from February 11th going into Friday's trade. Joining me from Chicago is COO of Option Pit, Mark Sebastian. Mark, is this more of a technical rally or do you think fundamentals may have improved here? Um, I think a little of both. Um, it's definitely a technical rally, although we broke through some big technical barriers yesterday. Uh, which is which uh, we're recording this on a Friday this Thursday when the S&P broke through 1950. Uh, I think fundamentally maybe things haven't changed in oil but the the perception of where oil is has changed. Um, even if oil is going to go lower the panic seems to be falling out of oil and the correlation between the S&P 500 and oil is starting to break. Uh, we uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday at one point oil was down uh, almost over 8%, I want to say, and the S&P was off, you know, 2.5%. Early, early January, that would have been 4 or 5% in the S&P 500. So I, I think the panic may be over in oil, and that's allowing the S&P to, to recover and rally. Well, we saw bullish comments out of the Nigerian oil minister on Friday afternoon, where he was talking more at length about the Saudi Arabia and Russian production cuts, and Qatar was involved as well. It seems as if there is going to be some stabilization in oil. Is really the message that he was delivering. Yeah, I, I think that oil may, may drop a little bit, may head back toward 20 but the, the idea that there's some major panic and a rush to sell oil is over. Right. And, uh, you know, now is the time where uh, we'll see some of the weak ones fall off, some oil, some smaller companies get, get scooped up. But uh, I'm expecting some consolidation here in the U.S. oil, uh, you know, conglomerates. And, yeah, uh, I don't know about a production cut, but at least no more ramping up of oil should, should help be helpful, especially with, uh, oil production probably falling here in the United States. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Well, that was Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino. What an effort is underway in Kenya to empower women workers in impoverished uh, settlements with training and other help from the European Union and Oxfam. Lenny Rovago reports from Nairobi on the challenges these women face as they strive to make a living in Kenya's informal economy. Paris Odero works intently on one of her designs. The mother of three has been working on a new outfit to please her prospective clients. A tailor for 18 years, the tools of her trade are her sewing machine, needle and thread, and material. Odero is part of a program run by the European Union in partnership with Oxfam, dubbed Wezesha, a Swahili word that means enable. 
Wazesha seeks to improve the lives of small-scale women traders and domestic workers by teaching them business skills. Odero says the training has improved her business. Before I was just using my money as I get the money. So at the moment I know if even if I get the money I need to write which amount is I got the, that very day, what I need to buy and the remaining one I can keep or I can save. The program rolled out four years ago and has helped 30,000 women across five informal settlements in Nairobi. Beatrice Jamurungu is a domestic worker. She earns about $200 a month, barely enough to meet her basic needs. After undergoing the training, I became proud of my work. I have also learned about reproductive health and the importance of staying healthy. I have also gained business skills since I never knew how to save. Caroline Wambui, Oxfam's Women's Empowerment Project Manager, says while Kenyan women have made strides over the years, more needs to be done. Even though we have a very progressive constitution, we still face a challenge in implementation. For instance, you'll find small-scale traders pay for services, for taxes, pay for services that they don't receive, and the women domestic workers do not receive, almost half of them do not receive minimum wage. For Beatrice Jamurungu, the new skills she has acquired will help her earn more for her family. Lenny Ruvaga for VOA News, Nairobi. Well, it's time now for a short break still to come on Africa 54. Well, hair turning glamour from the Oscars red carpets. We'll be right back. to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Simple, gorgeous, and elegant. It's the night that launches a thousand trends. The Oscars are widely considered the annual end all and be all of glamorous Hollywood events. Oscar winning best actor Leonardo DiCaprio teamed up with Kate Winslet for an, an impromptu Titanic reunion. It was anything goes when it came to the dresses, but the overall theme was elegance, rich uh, fabrics, Beautiful detailing and plunging necklines, of course. Uh, column dresses were still the go-to look with a twist. As for the men, no overtly out-of-the-box fashion choices. It was simple tuxedos all round. Will, be, will there be many copycat designs popping up soon? Of course. For more on the Academy Awards, visit VOSnews.com. Well, next up, could you be looking at the Oscar dress of the future? Now, fashion designer Agustina Filipova blends traditional costumes with more modern touches to create strikingly colorful and detailed outfits. Filipova's creations use rich fabrics, far beads, ivory, back, uh, dark, uh, rather, uh, batch dark, uh, bark, and horse hair. She says much of her inspiration comes from the wild landscapes of the remote part of the world where she inhibit, inhabits uh, Eastern Russia. A wedding dress designed by Filipova could cost around $2,500. All the decorative elements are drawn by hand, then digitized and made in China. Her beautiful creations have been modeled on catwalks in Moscow, Rome, and Scandinavia. 
Well, and finally, bucking a trend in Egypt. Filling up your gas tank in Cairo is no longer a task reserved ex exclu exclusively for men. A service station in the upscale neighborhood of Mahdi has for the first time hired women to work in what has been, until now, a male-dominated field. Gas station attendant is a common low-income job in Cairo. Each station employs between 10 to 20 attendants, depending on its size and location. Now, the station manager says the women were carefully vetted to ensure they were right for the job. Currently, the female employees only fill car tanks with gas. They don't carry out any car maintenance like changing tires. And that is what is trending today. Well, it's time for our Monday Sports Report. And here's Sunny Young with the sunny side of sports. Hello, Sunny. Hello, Vincent. And sporty greetings once again to our Africa 54 viewers. Let's kick off with the new president of FIFA, World Football's governing body. Gianni Infantino on the left opened the FIFA World Football Museum to the general public on Sunday in Zurich, Switzerland. It was his first official duty after winning the presidential election on Friday. The new museum, two years in the making, includes a giant soccer pinball machine for visitors to try. Among the more than 1,000 items on display are the World Cup trophies for men and women the museum also features a bistro, cafe bar, library, and seminar rooms. Infantino encourages football fans to visit. The passion of the people for football, boys, girls, uh, men, women, I mean, everyone who loves football should come and visit this place because uh, it makes you really feel good with yourself uh, if you love football. So I invite everyone to come here. Now let's go to the western U.S. state of Colorado and let's give a sunny side of sports salute to American cyclist Evelyn Stevens. She set a new one-hour record over the weekend, cycling just under 30 miles at the Olympic Training Center Velodrome in Colorado Springs. The 32-year-old Stevens worked a few years ago as an investment banking and, uh, banking and finance analyst in New York City before turning uh, to cycling full time in 2009. She's now regarded as one of the world's top female cyclists. Stevens competed in the women's road race at the 2012 Olympics in London, and she says she's now targeting the Rio Olympics in Brazil in August. I'm VOA Sonny Young, and that's the sunny side of sports. Vincent? Thanks a lot, and that's our show. Have a good night. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Does this word mean something good has happened? Unleashed. The President is sending Secretary of State John Kerry to the Middle East to help build a coalition to defeat the militants who have unleashed a wave of violence that has included attacks on Iraq's Christians and other minority communities, and recently the videotape killing of American journalist James Foley. Unleashed means to let something very powerful happen quickly. It is like taking a leash off a dog and letting it attack someone. In our story, the militants unleashed or set off a wave of violence. Usually, unleashed does not mean something good. So, the next time you hear the word unleashed, you will know what this news word means.